Greetings, greetings, uh, Zimbabweans and friends all over the world. We are here for the third in a series of the Policy Dialogue Forum on Zoom and as well as on Facebook. Our topic tonight is Zimbabwe towards constitutionalism and the return of the military to the barracks. I will shortly outline the problematic, but for now, let me introduce our panelists, discussants, and of course, our moderator. We have Alex Magaisa, who is our lead panelist for this topic, and he's the one who wrote that concept note for us. Uh, Alex Magaisa needs no introduction. He has become virtually a legend in the Zimbabwean political space with his blog, Big Saturday Read, which all of us read, whether you like it or not, you read it. Then I have my sister, Justina Mkoko, an activist, uh, one of our luminaries in the in the human rights movement. She's here often and for good reasons, as you'll see soon. There's a mystery panelist. I hope he emerges somewhere in the woodwork as we proceed with our discussion. But we also have a lineup of very eminent Zimbabwean academics, scholars, politicians alike. We have Paka Chipoera, the former Zipa commander, uh, one who was uh, arrested in 1977 along with other Zipa commanders and was released in 1980 after independence. We have Jonathan Moyo, who needs no introduction. Welcome, Jonathan. Lloyd Sachikonye, a consummate scholar, professor at the University of Zimbabwe. Blessing Gorajena, a constitutional lawyer, and very busy and active on the constitutional front. Simkai uh, Tinu, based in the UK. Welcome, Simkai. And last but not least, we have uh, our moderator, Violet Gwanda. To whom I now hand over, take over, and take us through the next two hours of a discussion on towards the constitutionalism and the return of the military to the barracks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ibo Mandaza, for the introductions. As we continue with uh, this SAPIS Trust Policy Dialogue series on Zimbabwe's deepening crisis and what we have to do now. As Dr. Mendez has said, today's main theme is Zimbabwe towards constitutionalism and the return of the military to the barracks. And as the series continues, the fundamental question we will be asking is, how can we stop the military from policing civilians? How do we make the military understand their role? We'll start with presentations from our main panelists, followed by a question and answer segment, which will include contributions from a number of selected discussions. Hopefully we'll be able to get policy recommendations on the way forward for Zimbabwe on the issue of um, security sector reforms. To our viewers, as usual, would like to hear your thoughts on this. You can get in touch via the SAPIS Facebook page where we are live streaming. And to those following on Zoom would like to ask questions or who would like to ask questions or um, contribute uh, directly, please raise your hands and we'll try and get a few of you in uh, to contribute later in the program. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our first guest, Dr. Alex Magaisa, who's, who was one of the designers of the Zimbabwean constitution. Alex, how are you doing? I'm very well, Viola. Thank you for having me here. Uh, thank you for agreeing to talk to us. Uh, so can you start with an overview of the relationship between the military and constitutionalism? What are the facts right now? Well, thank you very much, uh, Violet, and uh, thanks to 
Dr. Iba Mendoza and Sapers, Tony Rita, and everybody who has uh, played a part in getting this platform together. My brief requires me to lead on the question of constitutionalism and the role of the military within that uh, framework. Um, I have uh, 10 minutes, I am told, to do my short presentation before we get into the uh, questions that will allow me to elaborate on some of the issues which are pertinent. I'm going to try to compress the, the key issues within those 10 minutes. I have three particular points I'd like to make uh, at the outset. The first point is to understand the traditional role of the uh, military within the state or the traditional conception of the state as understood by scholars of constitutionalism, uh, political science, uh, organization, and, and so forth. It is that the state is divided between three armies. The first arm is the executive, uh, which many people often refer to as the government. The second is the legislature, which is often referred to as parliament. And the third uh, is the judiciary, uh, the, the courts of law. So state power is traditionally conceived of as uh, being divided uh, between or among those three the arms of, of the state. And a constitutional democracy is guided by both written and unwritten rules. Uh, these are uh, uh, rules that you find in, in the constitution which uh, demonstrate what the executive can do, uh, what the judiciary can do, and what parliament can do. The uh, notion is that these three arms of the state are supposed to be uh, 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 checks and balances on each other. In other words, whatever the executive can do, uh, the judiciary should be able to, to check the power that is exercised by the executive by interpreting the laws, as well as uh, pronouncing on the legality of the actions that are taken by the executive, as well as by parliament. So, so this is the traditional conception of the state, how the state is understood as organized, how political power is distributed within the state. So where does the military fit within that conception? Well, the idea is that the military is part of the executive branch of government, or rather that the executive branch of government is responsible for oversight uh, of the military. The command structure uh, is exercised by the civilian leadership in the executive arm of the state. And of course, you have the operational uh, parts of the military, you could call it the security structure, uh, which then has to uh, pay allegiance to, to those uh, executive uh, uh, heads. So you find that the president or the head of state in any country is also the commander in chief of the defense forces. You find this in Zimbabwe, you find this in the USA, in Kenya, in the United Kingdom, this power is exercised by the queen. Uh, so, so, so this is how the, the state is arranged. The military is there, but it is there as, as under the executive arm of, of the state. Now, uh, this is important, as I say, because the checks and balances are exercised between these three arms of the state. However, you asked me about the reality, and this is my second point. The second point is that, and this is an argument that I've made since uh, the November 2017 coup, that we have had a fundamental rupture of the Zimbabwean state, that we have had a massive and serious reconfiguration of the apparatus of the structure of the state. So that instead of conceiving the Zimbabwean state de facto as being the executive, the judiciary and the parliament, it is now also uh, comprised of the military. And I say so not because it is just my opinion, but I say so because there is judicial precedent if you remember during the days of the coup, there were quite a few cases 
which were brought before the courts in Zimbabwe. And one of those cases was heard by Justice Chiwesha. And what it basically said, the conclusion that was drawn by the judge, was that the military had acted constitutionally in defending the constitution. And so that was a, a, an authentication or a confirmation, a legitimization of the role of the military in effect as, a, as an organ that is the power to check and balance the other organs of the state, in this particular case, the executive arm of the state. And so my view has been that since November 2017, we have had uh, this reconfiguration of the state where the military is now acting as indeed a, a separate arm which sees itself as having the power to check and balance, to have oversight uh, over the other entities, over the other organs of the state. It's important for us to acknowledge this. I'm not saying that it is the right thing to do, but I'm saying so because that is the way it is. That is the de facto position. Now, some people might say, Alex, you are, you are saying since November 2017, actually, it is probably long before then. And I would probably agree with that, that it probably goes back to 2002, probably goes back to 2008. But my point is, it has become so flagrant, it has become so obvious, so blatant since November 2017. And that's why I use November 2017 as sort of the turning point or the marker. But I would concede that this position that I'm putting across now de facto may probably have always been the case for a long time before November 2017. So that was my second point. My third point, Val, as I conclude, is to give an understanding of the notion of constitutionalism, because some of our listeners here may be unfamiliar with the term, and they may be wondering, Alex is talking about the military, about the constitution, but what is this animal called constitutionalism? So allow me to say a few words about constitutionalism. So, Constitutionalism is a, is a legal uh, concept which essentially refers to the limits of power, the limits of state power. The idea of constitutionalism is that the state should be limited. So you, you, you have the organs of the state, but those organs of the state, when they exercise their power, that power has to, has to be limited in some way. They have to be what I call auxiliary mechanisms which ensure that there is no abuse of power because you see there is no point in having a, a, a state which is based on a constitution but that constitution is oppressive that constitution allows for the abuse of power uh, hitler ran a state you could easily say my my state was constitutional stalin did the same uh, idi amin did the same but they cannot possibly be said to have run a state which is based on constitutionalism. There were no limits to, to that power of the state. So constitutionalism, you could say, is a rein. If you are riding a horse, you want to rein it in, you want to control it. And so it's about control of power. Now, let us understand the organs and the elements of the state. The most powerful of them all is the military. Because the military has guns. The military has got coercive power. It is able to do things that no other organ of the state can do. So it is important to make sure that the military is kept in check. And that's why we have these rules, which submit the military to civilian command, which ensures that while there is an acknowledged role of the military, it is nevertheless prohibited from interfering in political matters. And so there are boundaries that are set. The rules in this case, Violet, are both written rules and unwritten rules. For us to understand constitutionalism, I want to compare it to a belief system like any religion that people believe in. That religion requires a text that people refer to. That religion requires preachers. It requires advocates who sell the word, who teach the word who ensure that people understand the values, the principles, the norms that are accepted within that religion. 
that religion also requires people to believe in it. There must be someone with the power to persuade people to believe in it. So constitutionalism, in my opinion, is a belief system. It doesn't exist on its own. It exists because people must imagine that it, it exists. They must believe in it. And so there are norms. Some of them, we have written rules, like I said, the constitution, but actually a lot of them are norms and written rules, taboos that exist. And one of them, which is very important in our context today, are the rules and taboos which say the military should not interfere in politics, the military should be submissive to civilian leaders, you know, setting or creating these boundaries, ensuring that everybody understands what they have to do. The norms of respect for political authority, the norms of political accountability, uh, all these are important. You know, they, they, you, you, need, you need rules that allow people to understand that they are, even though you have power, you must exercise forbearance. You know, forbearance is a norm, which means you have the power to do something, but you choose not to use it. This is what is expected of those in the military within the context of constitutionalism. That yes, we have the guns, we have the ammunition, we have the tanks, we have everything. We can force you to do what, what we want to do. But you know what? We are not going to do it. This is what, what you expect in a constitutional democracy where these norms, these taboos, these rules, written and written, exist. That is a, an unwritten pact between the politicians and the soldiers. And now the problem that you have, and I'm going to conclude now, is that when those norms, when, when those taboos, are broken, you know, when people no longer believe in that system of constitutionalism, if nobody is enforcing them, then you have a problem. And I, I want to put it as I conclude that this is the problem that we have in Zimbabwe. So when we say a return of the military to the barracks, we are not just talking about a physical movement of soldiers from the streets of Harare or Bulawayo back to the barracks. No, no, no. It is about a return to the belief system that underpins, that supports the idea of constitutionalism. And as to what needs to be done to do that, I think these are the modalities that we'll be talking about as we go forward in this conversation. I'm going to stop here. Definitely. Thank you very much, Alex, for that. We will be talking a bit more about that in the second half of this program in terms of how then do we ensure that the military uh, returns to the barracks. But I just have a couple of questions for you before I move to the next uh, panelist, who's Justina Mukoko. Um, Alex, can you tell us what could be the reason why soldiers are so involved in our politics? Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, we have a lot of experts here and some of them are probably going to be uh, touching on, on, on that issue. But I would probably list about two or three things for the moment. Number one, uh, Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe has a legacy of the liberation struggle. And in the liberation struggle, the parties that led or that prosecuted the war were both uh, political and military. So there was Zanu with Zanla, there was Zapu with Zipra, uh, and, and the, the soldiers were also in some ways political. They were also uh, political animals. They, in, in Zanu, if I, if I recall it very well, there are experts who will correct me. Some of the soldiers said also in the Darele Chimurenga, which was the uh, sort of Supreme Court, eh? which was directing the prosecution of the war. So there was always a cross uh, uh, contamination or, uh, between the politicians and, and the, the military. So this is a legacy that we get. Maybe in the early you know, years of independence, there were efforts. I know that there was training which was provided by the British and so forth, people who came in to try and assist and professionalize the army. But I suppose the distance between the soldiers and the politicians was never quite established. And, and so uh, part of what we have now, this uh, symbiotic relationship, this deep connection between the politicians and the soldiers, the lack of respect for the boundaries is something that uh, goes back a long way. That's one, that's one way. One. 
The second one is the political economy. I think that what we have witnessed and there's many scholars who have written about uh, how Zimbabwe has become a predatory state and some of the key figures in that predatory system are figures from a military background. We've had a lot of people uh, during the uh, course of the last 40 years who have retired from the military and have moved seamlessly into, into positions of civilian authority in state in the state structures. Now, uh, I'm not an expert in this, but my reading of some of the texts seems to suggest that uh, upon retirement, even during the war, those who had uh, retired or had been redeployed from the front, the soldiers, uh, took positions uh, in some of the, what you might call civilian uh, parts of the prosecution of the struggle. So I guess this is something that also has a long history, but I stand to be corrected by those who are better placed on this particular issue. But yes, the political economy is important. The soldiers have amassed a lot of wealth, especially the top uh, brass, they've been involved in all sorts and uh, their interests are closely wedded to the interests of the political leadership. And so the survival of one is also a survival of the other. And, and so you see that in 2002, if I remember very well, the generals came out and uh, made their statement, which was interpreted by many people as suggesting that they would not support Morgan Changirai, but they would back uh, uh, President Mugabe at the time and, or whoever had liberation credentials. We have seen this over time, 2008, the intervention after the uh, 29 March election, which was won by Morgan Changirai, and of course, uh, November 2017, which is the biggest of them all. The second, the, sorry, the third aspect could be, I think there is a fear. I think there is also fear, fear of prosecution, fear of the unknown. Um, what we have is a lot of people who have been involved in uh, situations uh, where human rights have been violated. You can make reference to perhaps the biggest of them all, which is Gukura Hundi in the 1980s, but you can also make reference to the 2008 uh, post-election violence. We can also make reference to August 1, uh, 2018, the killing of civilians, and as well as uh, January 2019, killing of civilians. Now, you have all these, these human rights violations, these atrocities, which uh, present prosecutable offense. And so, of course, there is fear. Uh, there is fear that if the political leadership were to change, or if the situation were to change, what would happen? So, so this is a genuine, genuine fear that exists among those who, who have been involved or alleged to have been involved in these violations. I would, I would put that in the interest of time as three uh, important points uh, that I think are necessary to understand this continuing relationship between the two. Mm, and of course, you were one of those who were involved in designing the constitution. What did you experts uh, do to ensure that um, the political neutrality of the military was um, you know, intact or put in place? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Violet. You know, one day we, might, we may sit down for a whole day and speak about this topic, but I'm going to try and make it very brief. So the Constitution contains several provisions which were designed uh, with an understanding, with uh, the knowledge, the background, that we have a challenge in Zimbabwe, which is this uh, 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 relationship between the military and the politicians, which is unhealthy. Uh, and and it, needed, it needed cleansing. It needed a way of uh, finding a distance so that we restore the country back to uh, that situation in which the military is at a distance from the political arena. And so you'll find that there are provisions in the constitution which speak to the political neutrality of members of the defense forces, that they <laughs> should not favor any individual party, that they should not further the interests of any political party, they should not uh, be prejudiced against the, the uh, interests of any political party. You know, everything that has been happening for the past 40 years to say that we don't want that. 
And these provisions don't just apply to the military. They apply also to uh, other commissions like the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, the Zimbabwe Anti-Corruption Commission, and other institutions of the state. The whole idea was that those who serve the state must do so in a manner that is apolitical, that is politically neutral. So we have a lot of these provisions. I should also mention in just before the elections, as you remember, I used to work with uh, former prime minister, the late uh, Morgan Changirai, and uh, I was tasked to draft a code of conduct uh, for the military in election. And uh, that, that brief came from both President Mugabe and Prime Minister Morgan Changirai. I did as instructed, the two gentlemen, to my knowledge, accepted the code of conduct, but that was the last I had of that code of conduct. We never had anything about it ever. It was probably thrown into the dustbin. Uh, probably some people did not like it. But let me just say also that the constitution has a provision for what is called the, an independent complaints mechanism. Now, the reason why we included this independent complaints mechanism was to say that whenever anybody has any grievance with the military, they don't always have to wait for the long judicial process. We can create a mechanism which is constitutional, which allows for a resolution of any disputes, of any concerns that are raised by members of the public. So for example, if that independent complaints mechanism had existed after August 1, 2018, we would not have needed the Montlandi Commission. That independent complaints mechanism could have dealt with that matter. Same with the January 9, 2019 issues and other concerns that have been raised over the last seven years. Now, here's the problem, Violet. This government has not been willing to implement all parts of the constitution. So a lot of Zimbabweans, including many people who are listening to this conversation, probably have no idea that such a body should exist. But the only reason why it doesn't exist is because the government is unwilling to implement it. Now, why they are unwilling to implement it, nobody knows. Are they having pressure from the military which doesn't want it? I would have thought that it's actually in favor of the military, that you have a body which performs this role an independent body which includes civilians, which includes retired uh, personnel from the military who understand. The whole point is to have something which is useful, something which is independent, something which provides for an expeditious resolution of disputes. And finally, of course, we had provisions which require political accountability. So whenever soldiers are deployed, whether in Zimbabwe, or whether they are deployed outside the country, there is a requirement that parliament must be involved. This provides for political accountability. Unfortunately, what we have heard so far is that whenever soldiers have been deployed, the, the political leadership has either had to be forced to take this position to explain this, or they have taken very long for them to comply with the constitutional provisions. So we have a serious problem. And the problem okay. that we have is that nobody Nobody is, uh, is uh, interested in implementing the constitution and ensuring that the letter and spirit of the constitution is in place and that the spirit of constitutionalism is upheld. So, so that's, that's all I can say for now, Violet. Those are some of the issues we want to tackle um, uh, today, especially on the issue of how do we then even ensure or put pressure on the government to implement the constitution because that's the most important uh, issue. But uh, we'll come back to you, Alex, and thank you for those insights. Uh, let me bring in our next panelist, Justina Mukoko, who is the National Director of the Zimbabwe Peace Project. She's also the Chairperson of the Zimbabwe Human Rights NGO uh, Forum and Vice Chairperson of the National Convergence Platform General Council. Her presentation today is on the role of the military and human rights abuses. Justina? Hi, Justina, you have to unmute your mic. Justina? 
Okay, I think we lost Justina. We'll, we'll bring her back um, when she comes in, uh, when, 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 when she's back online. But uh, let me get um, Dr. Ibu Mandaza to come in here. Um, Dr. Mandaza, Alex Magaisa has raised uh, quite a, a, a lot of points. And one of the, the issues that he raises is about this, the fear of per persecution and losing um, the assets in terms of the military. How then, uh, you know, can, uh, can we manage their fear in terms of getting the, the army uh, to reform when they have all these uh, issues that they, they, they're worried about? Dr. Mandaza. Uh, Violet, I thought I was, I was coming in after just uh, Justina. Um, maybe I should just say the following. The first is that really the, uh, Alex has really outlined the issues quite, quite sufficiently, I thought. But I just want to highlight three things. The first is that for the e uh, ease of understanding of the constitutionalism, in my view, it means the separation of powers, an accountable executive, a vibrant legislature, and a fiercely independent judiciary. We'll agree that neither of these exist in the Zimbabwean uh, pol polity. And as Alex has also explained, we need non-partisan national institutions or institutions that are, are staffed by people who are non-partisan, national, patriotic. Again, this cannot be the same of the same. But what is true though, is that uh, in summary that the, the, both the constitution and the Defense Act of Zimbabwe prohibit the involvement of persons in the military public service, the intelligence from getting involved in politics beyond the right to vote. Again, that principle has been increasingly abrogated over the years. As one of the first uh, civil servants in post-independence Zimbabwe and a member of the Defense Forces Commission from 1982 to 1988, I can confirm that there, there was generally adherence to the constitution. The defense forces were apolitical. Even, even though people like Juru, Rex, and Nongoi were people who came from the Zandla, generally there was an adherence to the constitution, the Lancaster House constitution. And we had independent national institutions. Uh, I think this principle uh, in the constitution has become increasingly, became increasingly abrogated over the years. And I think there are three major reasons for that. The first is the involvement of the military in, from the very beginning in post-independence, the Gukura Hunde. Secondly, the military, the role of the military became very, uh, uh, very, very uh, prominent, uh, uh, especially after the 90s, to the point where the ZANU-PF became weaker and weaker, especially at elections. And conversely, one might say the, the military be became stronger and stronger and became the backbone through which ZANU-PF was able to, to sustain power. Yeah, to this day. But I would agree with people like uh, Jonathan Moore and others who have said now ZANU-PF has become an appendage of the military, very much so. And this is pronounced, uh, as I have said in my, the political column of the state in Zimbabwe, the rise of the sectoral state, uh, especially after 2008, where Mugabe lost people's school in when Mnangagwa and Chiwenga forced Mugabe to stay on. And thereafter, he became very much a hostage to these people. Um, and 
also you saw how the constitution was abrogated the term uh, defense chiefs are supposed to serve two terms but you saw by the time of the coup people like chuhuri has been 27 years in office chuenga likewise Dr. Mandaza, your, your, your sound is breaking up, so we'll come back to you. Uh, um, but I understand that Justina Mkoko is back online. Justina? Yes, I am. Hi, how are you doing? I'm very well, thanks, Violet. Uh, good, good. Now, I understand your presentation is on the role of the military and human rights abuses. Can you tell us what has been the military's involvement in perpetrating uh, gross human rights violations? I think a lot of the groundwork has been set by Dr. Magaisa. Um, I think he mentions that the military has guns and uh, as human rights defenders, we are concerned that uh, the guns are running amok. And what we are seeing at the moment is that we are continuing to see violations of human rights where the military are concerned. I think you will agree with me that um, in the last few years, uh, beyond November 2007, we would see the military uh, coming out in terms of their community assistance week uh, as we go to commemorating uh, Zimbabwe Defense Forces Day, where they would go into different good seeing a totally different um, situation in the sense that um, I think the violation of rights that they are involved in. Wow, the sound quality today is really bad. Um, I'm not sure what's happening, although we've been hearing that um, there've been internet problems in Zimbabwe. So we do apologize for that. We will again try to bring back Justina and also uh, uh, Dr. Ibo Mandaza later. But um, let me go to uh, some of our discussants who are here. I understand Professor Jonathan Moyo, are you online? Professor Moyo? By change, I am. <laughs> How are you, Prof? The lines are better than Harari. <laughs> so, Prof, your, your, first of all, your thoughts on this uh, whole uh, uh, topic in terms of, uh, um, you know, constitutionalism and the return of the military to the barracks. What are your initial thoughts? And then later, I'd like to ask you for, you know, your comments regarding some of the points that uh, Dr. Magaisa has raised. Thank you, uh, uh, Valet, and uh, uh, thank you to SAPES for inviting me on uh, what I believe is a not only timely uh, discussion, but uh, important one for the future uh, of our country. Uh, I would like to also thank uh, the, the panelists, uh, especially uh, Dr. Magaisa, who has spoken. Now, um, just in terms of uh, my uh, overview uh, tech, um, I think that there's a, a, a risk uh, of looking at this uh, important issue from a conclusion, uh, which is to say, you take a position uh, and uh, a, define what constitutionalism is uh, and uh, uh, the sub uh, uh, focus is on the military uh, and uh, the suggestion is that um, they should return to the barracks. Uh, well, uh, first regarding the subtopic, it's news to me that uh, they left the barracks or wherever in the barracks to start with. You cannot return to where you have never been. We have never had a military 
That is a paramilitary. We have always, right from the beginning, and in fact, perhaps uh, since the earnest start of the liberation struggle, uh, had a military that was very much uh, part of the political process, if not the decisive and political, uh, I mean, a, a, a pivotal part of that uh, political process. The gun has always dictated politics in Zimbabwe, and this is our fundamental problem. We have never had a situation where politics dictates the gun. That's my first issue. Uh, my second issue, uh, uh, Violet, is that um, uh, we in Zimbabwe, uh, as far as this uh, uh, topic is concerned, have, in my view, two fundamental problems. We have two unsettled questions uh, which uh, inform uh, the rather precarious state of constitutionalism or lack of constitutionalism in Zimbabwe. The first one is that uh, in our country, 40 years now since independence, we have not settled the question of the means for getting into power and the means for staying in power. And finally, the means for getting out of power. This remains an unsettled question. Uh, and in so far as this is the case, and, and, and we can have a, 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 a more focused discussion on that, um, how you get into power determines how you govern. And if there are no constitutional means for getting into power, it is unreasonable to then expect constitutional governance. Um, uh, elections have always been contested in Zimbabwe right from the beginning. And until that question is resolved, you cannot expect people who rig elections to then subject themselves to limited government. You cannot expect people who use the gun or as we saw in uh, uh, 2017, uh, an outright military coup. You cannot expect a military junta to be a, a constitutional government. Uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned, constitutional government in a constitutional democracy is a function of the means for attaining power. If you attain that power from the people, then you will be accountable to the people. If you attain it on the basis of the gun, you will be accountable to the gun. But I think this unsettled question produces a problem of constitutionalism, largely because as a society, we have never asked the fundamental questions about what is a good society? What is a good society in terms of the fundamental rights and freedoms of the people and their fears. And which of the freedoms are people prepared to give up in the interest of the larger community, in the interest of the society, and to give up to an authority that they believe is theirs and represents them and is there to protect them. In Zimbabwe, we don't engage in fundamental questions of the type of society we are, which are about really right and wrong, fundamental moral questions. We jump into conclusions. We approach issues armed with a conclusion, and then we want to defend that conclusion. And lastly, in relation to this, uh, uh, or these two unsettled questions, uh, uh, regarding how you get into power. That is the fundamental question. You settle that, everything else falls into place. Uh, there is, in my view, the question of the kind of political culture that we have as a society. What is Zimbabwe's dominant political culture? I think it is very dangerous to ask a question which is about some small part of the society, even if it may be a very powerful one, especially if it is armed. We need to ask a fundamental questions of political culture about all of us, about the whole society, 
What is our political culture? What is the dominant political culture? Uh, it is important to have one standard for everyone. What I find very interesting and useful from the constitution that uh, uh, was framed in 2013 and uh, subjected to a referendum and therefore adopted by the generality of Zimbabweans is that for the first time, unlike in the Lancaster constitution, we have two fundamental uh, pillars that in my view, we need to use as a starting point to arrive at some practical uh, formulation of constitutionalism and its implications, not just on the military, but on other players. Number one, um, the idea of a constitution, which is the fundamental law of the land, the primus of the constitution, which is uh, above all other laws, uh, customs, practices, conduct that, that are inconsistent with it, that are not uh, uh, in conformity with it, is a very important idea that we have not debated and discussed as Zimbabweans as to its implications. It is important because out of that idea that this shall be the fundamental law of the land and that certain practices that might come from the liberation struggle, from culture, from religion or whatever uh, else you might have will be inconsistent with this constitution or rather will be invalid if they are inconsistent with this constitution is very important. It is a very important pillar of uh, uh, constitutionalism that we have not uh, uh, examined as a society. This is, a, 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 in my view, an important part of the new constitution. Why? Because out of that idea, we have obligations that are imposed by the constitution on everyone, not just on the military, not just on the executive, but on all persons, juristic persons or nat uh, uh, natural persons as, as, uh, uh, as, as, as we are human beings ourselves, institutions of the state, of the executive, the judiciary uh, and the legislature. There are obligations imposed on them and we have not really unpacked this. Uh, and when, when we do, we, we, we do it in uh, tidbits. We, we cherry pick uh, and focus on a, an actor, uh, in this case, the military uh, about whom we, we might have problems uh, or, or, or concerns. And really lastly, Violet, what I think is very beautiful about the new constitution, a constitution that we, have, we don't engage in and, 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 and make it a, li a living document. Uh, there isn't, it, it requires that, you know, the, the public be exposed to it, that there be discussions. But uh, since 2013, there has been no discussion of the kind that will make it a, a living document. But for me, what I think is very crucial and gives rise to a, a real a possibility for a, um, a, a, a constitution with constitutionalism are the founding values, uh, uh, not just of uh, 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 the constitution, but really of Zimbabwe, which are in section three of the constitution. That and, and there are nine of them. I just uh, wish that Zimbabweans could be alive to the implications of those nine founding uh, values or the pillars uh, of the constitution and therefore of our country. That the, the number one, that the, cons the primacy of the constitution, the primacy of the constitution over your customs, over uh, that are inconsistent with it, over your practices, over your conduct. Uh, uh, and, 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 and this is, to me, the heart of constitutionalism because it then creates a common base for all of us. And the second one that deals with uh, the importance of the rule of law, it becomes 
relevant in so far as it imposes obligations on you, on me, and on everyone. It confronts the ZANU-PF culture, this kind of culture that people are now saying it must go. They are not saying some individuals must go or some political organization called ZANU-PF must go. They are saying a certain culture, which is very dominant, but which is inconsistent with our constitution, which is inconsistent with the founding principles and values of that constitution must go. And then the fact that there has to be, which is the third one, there has to be a focus on fundamental rights and freedoms of every human being, not some good guys versus bad guys, but of everyone. And the fourth, that there has to be a respect for the diversity of our culture, diversity of our religion, and diversity of our traditional values. Uh, this is a conversation that we don't have as Zimbabweans, because once we begin to have that uh, kind of conversation, we will begin to appreciate not only what we have in common, but more critically, our differences. And those are the factors that inform a vibrant and a dynamic constitutional democracy. Fifth, that we must respect the dignity of the individual and the worth of that individual, any human being, all human beings, not some versus the others. And sixth, that we have to cherish that difference of uh, individuals by respecting and understanding that all human beings are equal, the equality of human beings. We in our society don't treat each other like that. We don't relate uh, to each other from that kind of template that we believe we are equal and we have an equal stake in the political process. And seven, the uh, question which I think to some extent we have made quite some progress regarding gender equality. The, 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 there's obviously still some challenges that we can see in our institutions, but I think we're making some progress. And eight, which is what I think really is the area of uh, concern when people talk about uh, limited government, it's the issue of good governance. Uh, it is very fundamental, but you know, it can't be meaningful alone without the, 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 the others uh, uh, that I've just outlined. And the last one, which was a major, major issue of discussion in uh, uh, our circles, in the Politburo, in ZANU-PF, during the constitution making a process, is the recognition uh, of and the respect for the liberation struggle. When we tabled this initially, it was about um, cherishing the values and ideals of the liberation struggle, that we need to be alive to what they were in order for us to liberate ourselves from thinking that the most important thing about the liberation struggle is who fought where, who did what. It can't be about who. You know, Zimbabwe is a sick society. There is too much whoism. There is whoism. Uh, and no focus on the ideals and values that uh, drove the liberation struggle, which are now uh, uh, um, uh, recognized in the constitution. Okay. So from an overall perspective, for me, these will be the factors that uh, lead to not a conclusion, but a discussion and, uh, a, a, and a debate uh, on uh, uh, constitutionalism uh, in Zimbabwe and the question of whether or not uh, uh, the military uh, should return to the barracks. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I think they should go to the bar barracks for the first time. They have never, we need to build some barracks for them. They have never been in the barracks at all for the 40 years that we have had as an independent country. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, uh, Professor Moyo, and quite a few uh, messages are coming in. Um, I'll try and combine some of them. 
uh, Miles Anderson asked, perhaps Professor Moyo could now give us a practical solution to muzzling the military. And also, uh, I would like to combine that question with a question that I'd asked um, uh, Dr. Ibo Mandaza before he went offline, uh, which was in response to what Alex Magaisa had talked about, you know, this fear of persecution and losing uh, their assets. So how do we manage their fear and get the, the military and those in power to accept a democratic transition or, um, you know, follow the rule of law? Professor Moy. Well, um, Dr. Mandaza, I, I, I'm not sure whether he's still here. Um, when he made his uh, uh, preliminary uh, uh, remarks, he said something about the military having been um, uh, or having ad adhered to non-interference with politics and so forth in the early years of our independence in 1980. Uh, but I was glad that uh, he then in passing referred to Gugrahundi. You know, the Gugrahundi uh, project was a military project. Uh, uh, not only in terms of the 5th Brigade, we know that uh, it is not the 5th Brigade that started uh, the atrocities, uh, the Gugrahunda atrocities. Uh, it was uh, one brigade. It was uh, the, the, the formal uh, structure of the military. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm having some slight uh, connectivity issues here. We can hear you. We can hear oh, okay, you. Okay, thank you. Yes. And the question of the fear the insecurity of the military. Uh, 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 and by, by, by the military, I think we should also uh, be clear that by and large, we are really not talking about the institution of the military because uh, our military does have, uh, it must be said, quite uh, some professional soldiers. Uh, we are talking about commanders. We are talking about the Mgagawa commanders uh, from the Zanda side who have dominated uh, uh, the leadership of the military and who have been involved uh, in virtually all the atrocities that have been committed in our country, whether against communities, uh, individuals, forced disappearances, uh, and, and so forth. These are the people who have insecurities, but they are limited in number. We can count them, and therefore we can deal with them. We can provide uh, uh, some, some, some practical uh, solutions uh, that address uh, uh, their insecurities. We, it's not as if we are dealing with the insecurity of the in, entire institution, but of uh, a, a given number of, of commanders. Uh, uh, it is quite a, a, a big problem for, for some of us that the commanders of Gugrahundi uh, forces are now at the echelons of, of the Zimbabwean military. It is a major, major problem. Only in Zimbabwe would you have something uh, so outrageous that people who committed atrocities and it is not a, a debatable issue where, uh, that they did so, this is a well-documented issue right now, are nevertheless presiding over the military today and some of them uh, uh, are, are our government. And this to me raises a very, obvious question is what should we do? I think it calls for a truth and justice process uh, uh, where uh, arrangements can be made uh, as long as these people come forward, uh, uh, tell the truth about what happened, what they did in order to assist the society to heal and they get some amnesty out of that if they uh, uh, come forth and tell and, 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 and are truthful. And face the consequences, face the music uh, if they don't. I mean, you can hold people to account if they uh, are prepared to come forward and tell the truth, or if they don't, and there's a lot of available uh, uh, information uh, that can be used uh, to hold them accountable. So for me, uh, the solution lies in some truth and justice uh, process. But it, it's so easy to, to say that, Professor, uh, the military is all powerful. How do you even get them uh, to the negotiating table to, to, to talk? Is, uh, is, uh, 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 um, is, is that what you're talking about, that we have to engage 
uh, the, the military, they have to come and also talk about uh, some of these issues. But how do you get them? Uh, well, I, the kind of I didn't that say that you should negotiate with them or engage them. I think you, are, you must be referring to a conversation elsewhere. But right here, I did not say that. Uh, uh, you, know. you see, issues of fundamental rights, human rights and so forth, are not matters of negotiation. Uh, we have uh, sufficient instruments now for, for dealing uh, uh, with questions uh, uh, of, of this nature. I just think that uh, there is in our society an assumption that these are very powerful people, you can't deal with them. Yes, of course, because they have the guns and they have these 1945 tanks and 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 uh, and, 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 and But the, the, the real issue is whether the people of Zimbabwe are prepared to stand up uh, and uh, assert uh, their rights. Because uh, in the final analysis, if what the people do, how far they are prepared to go. Um, I don't think that um, the military in Sudan uh, was in any way uh, special compared to the military in, uh, in Zimbabwe, or even more powerful than the military in Zimbabwe. But it was forced to face the consequences because the people were prepared to stand up for their rights. Okay, let me bring in um, uh, Alex Magaisa here. Uh, Tatenda Mashanda asks, what is the incentive for these generals to come forward? Um, you, know, you know, first of all, um, Violet, I should say the comments that have been made by uh, Professor Jonathan Moyo, and I'm glad that he raised issues concerning the supremacy of the Constitution as well as uh, the issues of founding values and principles of the constitution. I noticed that the interest, of course, <laughs> of many people is how do, you, how do you handle the military? I guess, I guess this is the avenue to which uh, people were sort of leading or taking Professor Moyo. Uh, and and Tatenda is also asking a similar question. What I would like to do is to continue uh, with those pillars that uh, Professor Moyo mentioned. But I want to focus specifically on one aspect of the constitution of which I am quite proud. And I hope that Zimbabweans understand what it, it, it means. And I know that Professor Moyo was getting to it. Uh, we did not have this provision in the old constitution. And I know very specifically why we included this provision. It is a provision which occurs more than once. And it says that authority to govern derives from the people. You also find this in the constitutional principles and the founding values in section three. But you also find it under the executive section of the constitution it says executive authority derives from the people, judicial authority derives from the people, legislative authority derives from the people. Now, this is absolutely fundamental because it provides that ownership of authority to govern vests in the people. And that those who are holding it at any given time are holding it in trust or on behalf of the people. In other words, if the people so decide, if the people choose to withdraw that authority, they have every right and every power to do so because that power derives from them. Now, what many people have been told in the past, traditionally, is that once you vote in a government, you wait for five years until that government comes for an election and you either vote it to remain or you vote it out. This is the very traditional conception. But what I would like people to understand is that the constitution provides for this very fact that authority derives from the people and therefore they can withdraw it at any point that they wish to withdraw it. 
they can give notice that we have given you this authority in 2018, but this is 2020, two years, we have seen that you are unable to use this authority. We have seen that you are abusing this authority. Therefore, we want it back. And so the question is, how do they do that? They do that, of course, using the other pillar that was referred to by Professor Moyo, which is a pillar of constitutionalism, which is the exercise of fundamental rights and freedoms, which are provided for in chapter four of our constitution. And in there, we have three very fundamental rights. Number one is section 59, sorry, section 58, which focuses on freedom of assembly and association. Essentially, that people can assemble anywhere at any time of their choosing. They can associate with anybody that they wish to associate with. And of course, it also includes the right to disassociate with anybody that you no longer want to associate with. This is important. If you no longer want to associate with certain persons who are holding political power, you are entitled to disassociate yourself from those people. Number two, section 59, which is the right to demonstrate and petition. We had this right under the old constitution, the Lancaster House constitution, but it was subsumed under other rights. Under the 2013 constitution, we made a very specific point that the right to demonstrate and to present petitions must be provided for separately. It is important to ensure that anybody who wishes to express themselves by way of demonstration, are perfectly entitled to do so. Number three, we have section 61, which is the freedom of expression. Again, like the right to demonstrate, everybody, anybody has the right to express themselves in any manner, in any way. And expression is a wide concept, as anybody who understands constitutional jurisprudence appreciates. You can express yourself in so many ways. And so the point I'm making, Ray, is that if you combine the fact that authority to govern derives from the people and therefore people can withdraw it at any time, you combine it with these rights that can be exercised, then of course you've got yourself. And the reason is people do not understand, people do not know that they have these rights. And this is the very reason why, as Professor Moyo said, People have not engaged the constitution. People have not talked about the constitution. The government is not stupid when it does that. They have not engaged, they have not taught, they have an obligation to promote constitutional awareness, but they have deliberately not done so. Because how can you arm people with knowledge and information that they have got these rights, that they have got these powers? If people knew, if people understood that they do have these powers, that their own constitution, which they are approved by a figure of more than 94%, provide them with these rights and that they do not, they are not exercised at the benevolence of the state, but they are exercised because you are the custodians, you are the owners of that power. So what is the incentive? The incentives can only be created by the people. The incentives can only be created by the people expressing themselves, using their rights as provided for in the constitution, asserting their authority to govern, ensuring that we, you have the authority that we gave you, but you are no longer exercising it in our interest. But we therefore Dr. want to take it back. But Dr. Magai says, easy to say that, but we all know that people have tried uh, to do some of those things, especially demonstrate, and you've seen what happens either you get arrested or beaten up. So it's not that easy. It's easy to say, but it's not that easy when you have a vicious state machinery that uses the law against the people. Um, there's a question from. See, a mm -hmm. Sorry, Violet, to, to, to cut you short there. Uh, you, you make a point, but you know, one of the biggest challenges that we have as a people and I include myself among those people, is that we are very good at uh, centering ourselves and at allowing ourselves to police ourselves. Uh, this, is, this is something that is covered by many very, very great scholars who talk about how in an authoritarian system, 
uh, people tend to police themselves. They tend to control their own behavior. So they say, this happened before, this happened to so-and-so. We have done this before and it hasn't worked. This is exactly what authoritarian regimes like. They like individuals, they like people to believe that they do not have power. So I do take exception to the argument that it's not easy. We all understand that there are challenges. The Sudanese said the same thing. Uh, the Tunisians would have said the same thing for many years. But at some point, at some point, there has to be a point at which you say, I am able to express myself, I am able to do that which I feel that is impossible to be done. It is not new to us because we have been there before. We, we, we did not get our independence on a silver platter. Okay, no, uh, thank you, um, Alex. Let me bring back uh, Dr. Uh, Mandaza. Is he back online? Dr. Mandaza. Yes, I'm back, I'm back online. Can, I, I'm sorry, but we've we been uh, either someone had blocked us, I don't know, for uh, almost close to half an hour. So I sort of didn't follow much of what uh, uh, Jonathan Moyer had to say, but I want, I want to come in on the question, uh, what, what can be done to uh, get the military back to, to the barracks? I, I disagree with Jonathan when he says the military has always been uh, very, uh, 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 very prominent in politics. I repeat, the first 10 years of independence, the military were in the barracks physically, right? Uh, and I can say so as a member of the Defense Force Commission, although of course it was just during the same period that the military was very active uh, in the Gukrahundi. I think the, the three points. One is that the position of the military in Zimbabwe is a very odd situation. It's an oddity in the region. The, we have three other countries which, uh, which went through a liberation struggle, uh, Mozambique, South Africa, Namibia. And if the military is not dominant in politics in those countries, I don't even know, I mean, if you even know who's the, who's the, who's the uh, chief of defense in, 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 in the South African army, or in Mozambique, or in uh, Namibia. So it's a very odd situation, which must also provoke the region as well. It's, it's anomalous, for example, that now Zimbabwe is the chair of the organ on politics, defense, and security of SADC. Very odd, inappropriate, when we have a military, a military, a military uh, establishment. That's the first. So I think it's an issue to be addressed by the region itself and also by Zimbabweans. This is a very odd situation. It is improper, it is unconstitutional, and therefore it must be addressed. The second is that the coup of 2017 has not worked. Restore legacy has not happened. The liberation uh, uh, narrative has died, okay, which was said to be the pretext for the coup. It has not worked. In fact, if anything, the coup itself uh, was a stage in the disintegration of this sacred state. Thirdly, it is unsustainable. The military must realize that to the extent that the, the crisis in Zimbabwe has deepened economically, politically, socially, is also the extent to which mil the military, the role of the military is unsustainable. Is the military prepared for the ultimate where they have to face the population? Should the population continue to, 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 to abuse the population? Or are they prepared, as Jonathan hinted when I could still hear him, to sit down and realize that they must come to terms with the population? Do we have to have more bloodshed before they realize that? So I think there is a basis not negotiating with the military, but for them, and we know them, the, the commanders, the PVC banders, the Isaac Moyos, the Zimondis, the Chimonios, they are Zimbabwean citizens like us. Don't realize that this situation is unsustainable. This is, this is the, the three points I wanted to make at this point. Okay. Um, Professor Moyo, can you come in? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you Violet. I 
don't want to make uh, much out, uh, out of this uh, uh, in, in this context. Uh, I, I wish we could uh, um, focus more on some of the issues that uh, uh, Dr. Magaisa was now elaborating on, especially the question that the uh, sovereign authority is with the people and specifically executive authority, judicial authority, and uh, legislative authority. And that the people are the ones holding the biggest recall card. It is not Monzora, it is not uh, Kupe, it is not Mdenda, it is not Chinomona. It's the people who, who have that. Uh, and they can use it uh, quite effectively and also constitutionally because uh, it is within their power. However, I, I just want to say, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm surprised when I hear my brother, uh, Dr. Mandaza, saying that the uh, military was in the barracks uh, in, the, in the early years of the independence. Uh, and at the same time, uh, and rather in passing, pointing to Gugrahundi. I mean, it is not possible. These, these two things cannot be reconciled to say that they were in the barracks and at the same time, they were uh, uh, in at least three provinces, the two Matabelan provinces and, and, the, and, and parts of the Midland prov uh, province committing atrocities where some 20,000 people were, were, were massacred and where there has not even been a full disclosure uh, of what exactly happened uh, there. You cannot have a, a genocide taking place and, 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 and say that the military were in the barracks uh, uh, somehow uh, 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 acting professionally. And I think this is what is wrong with our country. I think we have to be honest, these problems that uh, the rest of the country is experiencing now were experienced in very brutal ways, untold ways, uh, in Matabeleland. And it was this military that was doing that. And we have to remember that when the ZANU-PF Central Committee made the decision in December 1982 to deploy a political brigade in Matabeleland, uh, which was then deployed in January 1983 in, in Cholojo, it is the military that attended that briefing and that then went to um, uh, the affected regions to, 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 to give them uh, the marching orders coming from ZANU-PF. This was not from KG6. This was from uh, Shek Shek building. And, and, and unless we are prepared to confront this issue about the history of, 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 of the military in Zimbabwe, and that we have essentially a Gugrahundi army, which is a very political army. If you look at the atrocities that uh, were committed subsequent to the Gugrahundi years, it was the military elements that had been deployed in, in, in Matebeleland. They are the ones that have been involved in all this, even uh, Operation Murambatsuna, you look at uh, the uh, 2008 uh, 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 election atrocities and you look at uh, the coup itself. But I'm a little bit concerned that when we look at this issue, which has now become a problem for everyone in the country, once upon a time it was a problem for a part of the country, uh, we seem not prepared to face it fully and, 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 and have the army account for it because the people, a, a, a very political army, political generals, the generals, the political generals uh, who were involved in Gugrawundi are the generals who are heading the army minus the Zipram Berengwa element, the Sivanda, PV Sivanda, uh, Elson Moyo, and, uh, and, and, and these who have one, one foot in the, in, in the cabinet and another foot in KG6, like uh, 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 SB Moyo uh, uh, and so forth. 
the, the, there is an interesting dimension that is at play right now that a significant part of the military leadership is, is, is not tainted by Gugurawund. They were kind of warehoused and rose through the ranks professionally. They had to prove themselves the hard way because politics was not a, a, a good currency for them. You have them now on the one hand. On the other hand, you have these Gukurahundi commanders who have been political right from day one, going back to 1975 in Gagao. And they are responsible for the militarization of our politics. It is not a coincidence that when the commanders through General Chiwenga met President Mugabe on the 16th of November, 2017, carrying a two-page uh, demand, uh, 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 the coup demand. They had seven demands. Six of them were about, they were political demands through and through. And, and, and all of them having to do with taking over ZANU-PF. Only one of those demands related to their terms of service and conditions of tenure. They had not suddenly discovered that, you know, politics could be sweet. They, have, they had been in politics throughout the 38 years. They had, they had uh, imposed the President Mugabe uh, uh, at Mugagawa and the ZANU-PF Central Committee in 1977 uh, took wholesale the so-called Mugagawa Declaration and made it a Central Committee decision and that was bringing the army right into, in, uh, into politics. And it, they continued in that uh, uh, um, uh, 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 vein for the 38 year history of President Mugabe's uh, 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 reign. And we have to confront that. Mm -hmm. and, and it is not about fighting anybody, but this is a, 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 a bitter truth about our country. The politics of our country throughout the history of our independence have been driven by the military and since 2017, it has been openly so. They've taken over ZANU-PF, and that is why it has become physically a shell. That is also why ZANU-PF no longer has any hegemonic message. There's nothing that you hear from ZANU-PF head headquarters of any political nature right now, because it's the military that is calling the shots openly. I will bring in uh, Dr. Mandaza just now, but there's a question that's also just come in uh, saying, can Professor Moyo respond to this? Who is the head of the army, if not those who would have been victims of Gukura Hundi? I don't think I understand the question. Who is the head of the army, if not those who, 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 who were victims of Gukura Hundi? Yes, that's the can question. Can you explain? I don't um, understand that. Uh, uh, Dr. Mandaza. Yes, I, I, I can come in. I was just referring, uh, uh, Jonathan, to the, the Mberengwa group to which you made reference. The, 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 the curious situation in which those who would have been on the receiving end of Kukurahundi, namely the former Zipra, uh, the PVC banders, the alias Moyes and so on, who are now ahead of the, of the, of the defense forces, is not a curious situation. Uh, and secondly, uh, yes, I would say that the, the military has been very, very, uh, very, very prominent, as you have explained, but you, you, not, not, as, not, uh, not as prominent as they are now in the, in the 80s. But all the same, we need to deal with the fact, the composition of the hierarchy of the army now. How do we explain why the former Zipra, about six of them, are in fact the leadership? of the defense and security forces in Zimbabwe today. Uh, and, and, and to the point where the Mugagao group, which you have described very well, are, are almost subsidiary uh, or, or, or really um, almost marginal in terms of the balance of forces within the, the defense and security uh, services of Zimbabwe. Professor Moyo, did you want to comment on this or we can go uh, to the next speaker to just uh, 
hear from some of our discussions about the issues that have been raised. I understand we have Simeon Manza on the line. Quite a few are asking if Justina Mukoko is going to get a chance to finish her presentation. She's having internet problems. As soon as she's back, we will bring her back in. Simeon Mawanza, what about- uh, Hi, I'm on the line. I didn't think uh, I was going to say anything. I'm enjoying the debate. And also, you know, I have a two-year-old who is making lots of noise, so I don't think I can intervene without um, getting you on the phone. Okay, no, no, not a problem. What, what about Professor Lloyd Sachikonye? Are you online? Violet? How are you, Professor? I just wanted to... to, to Oh, it's Professor Moyo. Yeah. Okay, you, you can come in. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to uh, proffer what I think is a, an opportunity. Um, uh, often, I think when um, we as uh, Zimbabweans look at uh, institutions of government, we tend to think that they are uh, acting, you know, uh, in some common purpose with a, a shared uh, approach, uh, uh, when in fact, uh, usually that is uh, not the case. Um, uh, so I, 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 I want to draw your attention to an anecdote, and then I want to uh, address the issue about the former Zipram Berengwa and, and, and the under situation uh, as it is playing now. When uh, there was the final push, uh, I think it was 2001, uh, the historic, the famous uh, final push, I, I was in government. Uh, one thing that I remember about that uh, experience, which, which, which keeps visiting me now, as, as people are grappling with the deteriorating situation in our country, is that actually, uh, I remember vividly how scared these security people were of the final push. Uh, and how many of them, if not all of them, on the day, they were nowhere to be found. They were literally in the hiding afraid of the people thinking that the whole country is going to descend on, on, on them. Very, very afraid. There is a tendency to think that you know, they are all macho and uh, 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 go-getters. They are so fearful, so afraid of the people. So, uh, yes, and, and I'm addressing a question you were raising, uh, Violet, because you were giving the impression that certain things are easier said. But other things are also easier assumed uh, and are not quite, uh, um, they, 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 they don't match with the actual experience. So please take note. Take note. I don't know. No, when I say certain things, I lose my, my, my connection. Are you hearing me? Yes, 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 we, we, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. So I just wanted to point out that, in fact, inside there, there isn't that uh, strongman uh, 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 view. Uh, the system is very afraid of uh, the people. The people of Zimbabwe, unlike other populations in, uh, in the region and elsewhere on the continent, have not yet discovered the power that they have. And that is the only difference uh, so far. You know, we allow them to do certain things which they would not get away with uh, el elsewhere. For example, when a parliament recklessly exercises this recall power in the manner that uh, Jacob Mdenda and, uh, and uh, uh, Mabel Chinomona have been doing, we tend to think 
the victims and targets are members of parliament of the MDC Alliance or the leadership of the MDC uh, Alliance or even uh, Nelson Chamisa. We don't see it as uh, an attack on the voter. We don't see it as an attack on the citizen who has a, a right to join a political party and vote for that political party. And we allow we, uh, political parties to play games with the right to vote. You can imagine if people were to stand up and say, I'm not going to allow my vote to be subjected to the sort of games that are going on, because it's a constitutionally protected right. That is the, the, the one issue. But lastly, uh, Violet, I just wanted to say, it seems to me a con we should have as a country a conversation about the new situation that is emerging in terms of the leadership of the military. It is not a small issue that you have at the apex of JOC commanders from former Zipra who have never been ZANU PF in their lives, but they are commanders on the one hand. And then on the other hand, we have the Zanla commanders who have been um, uh, part of the command element throughout this period, but who right now have their backs against the wall uh, and most of whom have been retired and, 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 and made uh, ambassadors and, and, and so forth. There is an opportunity that we could deal with responsibly by having a conversation on what this means. For me, among other possibilities, it points to a dying ZANU-PF. It points to the possibility of something else uh, uh, being born. And whatever that something else might end up being, I hope it will be informed by the founding values and principles that we have in section uh, three of the constitution. And these commanders have an obligation to uphold that. And the constitution imposes obligations on them to do that. Okay, all right. No, thank you, uh, Professor Moyo. And uh, for those who are watching on Zoom and would like to uh, ask questions or comment directly, please raise your hands and then I will call you in to uh, contribute. Uh, while we're waiting for contributions from Zoom, uh, let me go to uh, Alex. With what um, Professor Moyo has just said, would you know what the level of coordination is between the so-called um, uh, good guys in the army and civil society? And I think also on um, Zoom chat, uh, someone had even asked that, um, are there any practical plans to get the generals on side in defending the people's rights? That is the constitution. Alex, you have to unmute. You have to unmute your mic. I'm 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 in now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I, I think that it's important to to emphasize a point that has been made by Professor Moy. Uh, and in some ways, I had, I had alluded to it uh, in in my earlier uh, uh, comment, which is that people in authoritarian regimes tend to to police themselves. Uh, we are the first people to say, uh, John, uh, you cannot do that because it is not allowed. Uh, Chipo, if you do that, uh, this will happen to you uh, because we have been conditioned to be in, in, that, in that environment. Uh, what, what we don't realize, and, and I think it's important to emphasize this point, is that those who are in positions of power and authority they often have no clue themselves what, what is going on out there. And they are actually probably very fearful of the consequences of what is going on among the people. A, another anecdote was the Didma Sumtasa anecdote in 2008. He told us well after, of course, in 2014, 2015, that uh, at that time, uh, uh, people were quite scared if, if the MDC and Morgan had asserted themselves. Uh, uh, who knows what, what might have happened at the time. So I think that all these things that we are hearing uh, from people like Professor Moyo who were insiders 
people like Jidima Sumtasa and others at the time, is he helps us to understand the nature of the beast and perhaps to take away some of the uh, mythical status that it has. You see, these fictions, these myths that are created around uh, these uh, authoritarian figures, they are very important for them. We have colleagues who tell us that, guys, you overthink these issues. Sometimes you give us, eh, and they are talking as NPF people, you give us the credit that we don't deserve. We are not even thinking the way that you think we are thinking. And so I think it's important to understand that because it helps people to demystify the nature of the beast, to demystify the political system, to understand exactly what lies beyond the facade of this political uh, system. So we, we should not create these barriers for ourselves. We should not be there to police ourselves so that we are unable to exercise the kind of uh, rights that we need to exercise in order to uh, 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 demonstrate and show the government that it does not have or its authority is based on the consent of the people. You see, there are two fundamental ways in which a government would be able to assert itself. One, it is by being able to get the consent of the people. And that is what Professor Moyo spoke about. How do you get into power? You get into power by people voting you into power. If you have the consent of the people, then you are exercising power in a way that has little difficulty because people agree with you. People are working with you. However, people have the power and authority to withdraw that consent. And once they do that, then the rule that you're exercising become very precarious. And this is what we are saying, that people should be able to exercise their power to withdraw their consent. The other way uh, uh, which, which is used to assert authority by these regimes is coercion, the use of force. But the use of force is very expensive. The use of force is very expensive because you must sustain the agents of force. You must pay them well, because the moment they know that you are reliant on their authority, on their power, on the power of the gun, then they continue to extract rents from you. The relationship can become inverted. And this is why it is expensive for authoritarian regimes to rely on force alone. And my view is that this current regime cannot continue to rely on force, especially when it is unable to do a quid pro quo with the agents of force. Because at some point, the agents of force will discover that they have power over those who are sending them. Alternatively, they will discover that their interests are more aligned with the people whom they are being asked to suppress. We have seen pictures of policemen, for example, riot police uh, arresting and sometimes beating up uh, nurses and doctors and other people who are protesting, treating them very unfairly. But you know, these people are probably earning less than the nurses who are protesting about their conditions of service. But it cannot continue like that. At some point, there will be a realignment of interests. And we have seen this in other countries. For example, the example of Sudan has been given, who would have known that the soldiers and the security details who would at some point begin to align their interests with the people. So I think that it's important while understanding the nuances of the Zimbabwean situation, of course, which makes it different from Sudan or from other countries, that it is not impossible to achieve uh, that particular position. I know that there will be a moment when I will talk later about the more, the bigger issue, but, but for now I'll, I'll stop there. Yes, definitely. We'll come back um, uh, to, 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 to get your thoughts on what really needs to be done, what is the way forward. But let me just take um, a few uh, comments um, or questions from uh, the Zoom chat. Uh, let me start with uh, Mr. Hooper because he's been raising his hand for a long time now. Um, can you unmute your mic and uh, just go for it, but can you keep it short, please? I think my mic is now unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Violet. 
Well, I'll really very shortly we'll just be addressing just three issues. First of all, uh, has the military always been out of the barracks, as uh, Professor Moyer said, or is in fact the position as Dr. Mandaza said? It? Well, in a sense, they are both right, because legally and constitutionally, the military did in in the beginning do what was the, the power within their power because when they came out even in Gukurundi, they were brought there by the government. The executive brought them in. Whether the question of the acts that they perpetrated is another matter altogether. So that's the first thing. But why do I say that in fact, in effect they have always been, that was down to ZANU PF. Because ZANU PF always portrayed themselves as the liberators. They campaigned elections as liberators. They brought in the military to do their bidding. But it's a, the old uh, matter that happens that the dog is brought in to obey a command, it gets powerful, then the tail begins to wag the dog. That's what's happened in my view in Zimbabwe. Now, <clears throat> second issue is, well, this fear of prosecution. Yes, there is a fear of prosecution by people who have perpetrated acts, but this can be a scene to. Some of you may recall that uh, shortly after independence, <clears throat> Edgar Takere was tried for murder. You may recall that in fact he was acquitted, lawfully acquitted, not because of the brilliance of his representation, but the fact that there was actually a law that had already been put in force by the previous regime of Ian Smith prepare in preparation for the time when they may be brought to book. That was done. So it is possible to have a legal provision to, that will uh, give them, sort of lessen their fear. And finally, <clears throat> the question of people power. Well, yes, uh, that is in fact, in my view, something that has to happen because hitherto, the pop, uh, pop, pop politicians have been addressing each other. There's been no real attempt to address the people. And by the people, in my view, remember this is Zimbabwe and like most of Africa, most of the people are in the rural areas. They're not in the towns. Politics has tended to be uh, something that it, only the people in the towns have become involved in. That is something that must, must spread. Finally, in passing, I, I am a Malawian, as some of you may know. Uh, I am a Malawian and a Zimbabwean, as far as I believe, <laughs> feel, because I've spent probably more time in Zimbabwe than I have spent in, in my motherland. People power in Malawi should not, people shouldn't think that it can work the same way in Zimbabwe. It, in fact, the Sudan analogy is probably nearer the situation. I say this because the, the military in Malawi, as you all know, in fact, sided with the people. The reason for that is quite simple. The military in Malawi has never been political. And most of them in the military, when they're back home from the barracks, they go back to their village. And that's why for them, it was quite easy to come in. But yes, the people in the countryside, the rural, the bulk of the population are the ones who should be addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for that. And uh, just uh, to read out a comment, um, I think also it's to do with the issue of people power. Uh, uh, Zoltz asks, what about soldiers shooting at people with live ammunition? Justina Mukoko and many others have been tortured. Itai Zamara and many others have been disappeared. Can these real demonstrations of brutality and evil be ignored? Those are some of the questions coming from um, uh, Zoom chat. Let me take another um, caller. Um, Tony Rila, do you have your ra hand raised? Thank you, Violet. Um, very interesting discussion. This uh, a lot of calls 
to the people to do something. And uh, two factors I think that are important. One is, is obvious fear. Uh, the state lost the political trust of the nation a very long time ago, back in the 90s, and responded to that by dealing with what Alex talked about by coercion, right? So uh, there are two factors that operate here when we ask the citizens to do something in all the words about apathy. There's both fear and lack of political trust. And that lack of political trust, that actually the problem is not leaders in Zimbabwe, it's about leadership, it's about vision, it's about where to go. And that's partly what we were hoping would come in these discussions. Somebody raised the issues about uh, accountability, and I'm very sorry that Justina was not able to talk to this very important report that the Human Rights Forum brought out, which is specifically looking at the gross human rights violations perpetrated by the military since the coup. And those are so egregious that uh, the forum has no, no compunction, but to call them crimes against humanity. So when this issue of accountability comes up, the call out there is that they are in very serious trouble when it comes to accountability. But those are two just, just minor points I wanted to make. The one I wanted to go back to the beginning and, and some, some things that Alex pointed out and about constitutionalism. Uh, and it's this issue in the constitution about how the military are deployed. Uh, Justice Chueshi argued, and it has not been tested because when it was tried to be tested in the uh, constitutional court, it was thrown out on the technicality. He argued that there are certain conditions in which the military may take it upon themselves to intervene in civilian affairs. In other words, the military can make up their mind at what point they want to intervene in, the, in civilian affairs. Now, this is complete nonsense, as Evo said. The Constitution is very clear about where the when the military must be deployed, how they must be deployed, and who must be consulted. So one of the big questions that faces us today going forward is on, on, on what power, what legal power, what constitutional power are the military actually on the street today? I am not aware that the president who holds the responsibility for this thing, and they must be deployed by his order, and he must consult parliament immediately about why the military are being deployed. Now, this is violated in, in, in every single way. Now, I, I know that Jonathan Moyle will say, well, that's exactly what happens. But the point is, we're not testing that. Nobody's going to court to say, was Chueshi's judgment uh, correct? Uh, and pushing that. Nobody's asking the question about under whose authority are the military on the street today? Uh, and why are they involved in civilian policing? Because this is very material to the whole issue of constitutionalism. And I think at this, you know, and, and, and particularly when the Human Rights Forum raises the point that that deployment then leads to such serious gross human rights violations that you could accuse the military right now of gross, human, gross crimes, of, of crimes against humanity. And those are the issues that I think in, when we start talking about getting the military to the barracks, you have to challenge the basis of it with all the tools that we have. And, and one of those tools is to go to the courts. Now, if the courts are captured and the state is captured, at least we have the possibility of establishing that, of showing the world exactly how things work in Zimbabwe. Because if you accommodate to the fact that the military are on the street, unconstitutionally and illegally, then uh, we don't have any case to make to the international community, and particularly the regional community. Because as Ibo said, Zimbabwe is an anomaly. Our military are doing things that no military in the whole region does. And we need to expose that and put the pressure on the military here from their peers in the region. Thank you. Thanks, Tony, and I'm sure um, Alex will come in and respond to some of the issues you've raised. And also, Alex, if you can just uh, um, note some of the um, questions from the chat. A lot of people are asking, why are all the legal minds failing to expose the courts uh, by taking all these matters um, uh, uh, to, 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 I mean, to expose the military by taking all these matters uh, to court? And that one is from Naomi Chitambira. 
Let me take another um, participant of your, Newton Kanema. Newton, you have to unmute. Yes, I did. I did. How are you, uh, Violet? Thank you for taking my, taking my questions. I have a comment and two questions. And unfortunately, they're directed at Professor Moyo. The first thing is that Professor Moyo, since you left Zimbabwe, I literally thought that you would be irrelevant and completely of no use as a citizen. But your contribution tonight makes me change my mind. Uh, I see that you could be a very useful person uh, as a citizen of Zimbabwe. So my two questions are, number one, since you left Zimbabwe, I am sure you have been reflecting on everything that you, have, you did when you were part of the government. Is there something that you have reflected on and found that you were fundamentally wrong in what you did and what we would like to know what that could be. The second question is you pointed out uh, the, what happened in Sudan and your analysis is perfectly right, except that uh, you, did not, you did not mention that, can you tell me? Yes, sorry about that. You can continue, Newton. Okay. Uh, the people of Sudan sustained their revolution mainly because each and every person who was on that square knew the provision of their constitution, knew their rights. People in Zimbabwe are pretty ignorant of the provision of their constitution. Professor Moyo was one person among all people in Zimbabwe who had the opportunity to educate our people on the provision of our constitution. I would like to know from Professor Moyo, what stopped him from educating the people of Zimbabwe on their constitution? I thank you, over. Uh, thank you, Newton. And Professor Moyo, we'll come back for your response. Uh, let me get uh, a couple of more people. Um, Eleanor Susulu, we'd like to hear from some women. Eleanor Susulu. Okay, good evening. And uh, thank you to the organizer, organizers for a fascinating co uh, conversation. Mm. I think I would like to comment on well, I have a question. This question of the lower ranks of the army and the generational difference. Hold on, please. Um, I some disturbances. Take team, please. Can we remove? Hold on. Yeah, it reminds me of a SAPES meeting when we had some thugs that uh, I was wondering if we were having a Zoom version of that kind of disturbance. They follow us everywhere. <laughs> yes. Now you can continue. <laughs> okay, so the question about the lower ranks of the army and and the upper the upper ranks, or my pages as to them. There's that, and then a comment I want to make about constitutionalism is that there is a real lack of appreciation of constitutionalism in this population in general. And it's something that really has to be addressed because people, for people, it's normal to see the army behaving in this way. And I just want to recount a, a, a story about, uh, told by the late uh, Professor Nkandawire about just which reflects this issue of constitutionalism that in Senegal he saw a, a crowd that had caught a thief and this thief uh, it was a citizen's arrest and the gendarme they called the gendarme and he came and he arrested the thief and then the thief said no this gendarme here it's not his job to be arresting me 
He's responsible for state security. This is outside of his mandate. It's the police that must have the right to arrest me. So the crowd debated on this issue and then they said, yeah, he's right. So someone went to get a policeman and the gendarme was told, okay, this is not your affair. And our reflection on that story was it would never ever happen in Zimbabwe. First of all, the thief would have probably been beaten by the crowd, but even if they had waited for him to be arrested, if a thief had dared open his mouth and be arguing about his constitutional rights, uh, he would have been shut down immediately. And it's, it's a consciousness of constitutionalism. And I've seen it in South Africa where people who have argued and are taking up issues, for example, the army's uh, beating and killing of someone in um, Alexandra, uh, that that issue is not going away. It's, 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 it's still there and people are going to court and it remains an issue, whereas it, it hasn't been an issue in Zimbabwe at all. Uh, so I think there's a lot of work to be done about just education of people in general to accept constitutionalism. And I think it's, it's reflected in the abductions that the state can actually get away with these kind of abductions and perniciously argue, in fact, that people are faking their own abductions. And uh, there's not more of a reaction to this. So I, and I'm often amazed at the lack of reaction in Zimbabwe to certain things that happened. Like when this young man was shot in Bulawayo by police, it's like it just happens and he dies away. And I think unless there's that stronger consciousness of human rights and constitutionalism, uh, the military will continue to get away with, with what they are doing. Thanks, Violet. Okay, thanks, Elena Sisulu in South Africa. Um, we are running out of time, but I can take three more from the floor. But please make your contributions very short because we would like um, the panelists to respond to some of the issues that have been raised. So it will be Lennon Ruizi, Fidelis Chima, and Nika Musia. Lennon, please, can you make it short? Uh, thank you, Violet. Um, my question relates to um the fear factor in zimbabwe uh people have vivid memories of um short hand or short hand short sleeve or long sleeve people have memories of um august 1 2018 in matebele land a lot of people have very vivid memories of gukura undi and um those memories are still fresh amongst our people and the fear factor has been, uh, in my opinion, the biggest tool in ZANU-PF's hand. My question is directed to Dr. Magaisa, that at a strategic level, what do you think the opposition could do to use that capital that people have in the rural areas to bring change to Zimbabwe? Thank you, Lennon. Uh, Fidelis, Chima? Yes. Is it Nika Msia? Okay, Nika, you can go ahead. Hello? Hello, Nika. You can go ahead. I wanted to give some, uh, maybe some clue on the command structure of the army, which was uh, talked by uh, Professor Moyo. I think the structure of the command structure of the army was a deliberate strategy by the current president to neutralize his deputy, who was the Defense Forces commander. The, the deputy, had, uh, as the Defense Forces commander, he had these loyal cadres who directed the coup. So the current president, I think he wants to break that uh, command structure by doing away with the Zandla element, which was very loyal to the deputy president so that he neutralizes that power by pu pulling away them away from the army into diplomatic positions and so forth. And then he has more comfort in the Zipra command running the army that they will not have that uh, uh, ability to organize the others for, 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 to, to, to launch a coup against him. I think that's a deliberate strategy to 
change the command structure of the army as a way to preempt a coup from the loyalists of the deputy president. That's my view. Thank you, Nyikamsia. Chorus Nyamukunda. Oh, Nyama, Nyamakunda, chorus. Thank you. Thank you, Violet. Mm -hmm. um, my, my question is all to the, all the panelists. The issue about um, the, the soldiers getting back to the barracks, what um, pressure can there be from the regional uh, groupings like SADAC, AU? Can they bring there? Are there any standards which they discipline each other? Thank you. And the last two, uh, Dr. Thompson Chengeta and Francis Chudu. So Dr. Chengeta. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question, Violet. Uh, my first question uh, relates to the issue of um, alignment or realignment of uh, interests, that is of citizens and the military. Uh, the question which I have there is, uh, you know, how can one be a citizen, for example, that indeed your interests as a citizen or as a private citizen are indeed aligned with uh, those of the military? I ask this question actually uh, from a historical perspective of what happened in 2017, where the majority of Zimbabweans uh, at one point actually thought that their interests and those of the military were aligned only to find out that it was the opposite. So in that regard, I, I, what are the precautions which one can take in as far as the idea of align, aligning of interests as far as delaying, for example, what others are referring to as retaining uh, the, the military to the barracks. My second question relates to the issue of citizen knowledge on constitutionalism or knowledge of the power which they have, which most of the panelists have been discussing on. I, I want maybe perhaps to take a sort of a step back from what I would view as maybe we are being elitist to just assume that citizens or the majority of citizens, uh, they do not know their constitution, constitutional rights and that they do not know the power which they have. And I link this to the aspect of impunity. If in the history of Zimbabwe, you know, whenever the people who are in power are committing crimes or are violating human rights, and nothing happens to them. There is no re remedial action that is taken. We have, for example, the examples of soldiers who shot civilians in the streets and nothing happens to that. I wondered if we could say that the reason, or perhaps one of the major reason why we are seeing citizens not going into the streets to claim their rights is because they are unaware of their rights or they do not know the power which they possess, or it's actually a real realization of what actually happens to you and after it happens to you, actually there are no remedial actions. The comparisons which some panelists have been giving uh, from other African countries, for example, in South Africa, I would say that you know, the, the, there are some nuances which you can actually be able to differentiate where you see if a government has been involved in a violation of a right, there's some sort of remedial action that is actually taken. In other words, there's no such levels of impunity. So in short, the, the question is, to what extent actually uh, the aspect of impunity as far as violation of rights is concerned is a contributory factor on how we are holding our government to account. Okay, no, thank you very much. Now, uh, Alex Magaisa, can we uh, come back to you uh, with your final remarks and would you also respond to some of the issues um, that were raised by um, our viewers uh, especially on the issue of why haven't there been any uh, court uh, cases um, and also what pressure can the opposition um, bring about in terms of uh, putting pressure on, on, on the military? Alex? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, uh, Violet. Look, there they have been a lot of contributions um, which are uh, similar questions, but I think that their contributions in their own right. And there is no need really for us to go through each one of them. We won't be able to finish within the limited time that we have. But I want to thank everybody for the contributions that they made. I just wanted to point out a, a point made by uh, Tony, Tony Rilla, uh, regarding the deployment of soldiers and the legality of those actions. 
which can be combined with the question which someone else asked as to why is there no action that is taken in connection with these issues and other connected issues, which is also similar to what uh, Dr. Chengeta has mentioned about the culture of impunity. Well, you know, this all points to a, a severe deficit uh, within our, our own society, a, a, a deficit which, which, which is about resources. It's not just about knowledge, uh, but it's also about the judicial system that we have. We haven't had uh, enough time today to even talk about the role of the judiciary. Uh, I did mention the role of the judiciary during the coup in uh, 2017, which essentially endorsed uh, through the High Court what were uh, unconstitutional acts that were uh, done, which is why a lot of us have always said from the very beginning that it was uh, an illegal uh, action. But of course, the courts uh, came to a different conclusion. The fact that the courts, you might say, or some parts of the judiciary <clears throat> are captured is also a reason why sometimes people are reluctant and see uh, uh, no way through the courts. It's a cow de sac. Uh, whatever they try to do, the outcome uh, is often very unfavorable. <clears throat> Matters can be uh, 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 dismissed on, on very small issues, on on technicalities. Now, I think that there is a case to be made on the issue of deployment of soldiers. Uh, I think that uh, that case could have been made uh, uh, on August, uh, two, 1 August 2018, concerning January 2019. Uh, and of course, at the moment, we've got soldiers who are deployed on the basis of COVID-19. Uh, but, but again, uh, these are opportunities to challenge uh, that system to challenge whether the legality of the continued deployment of these soldiers, whether indeed they are consistent with the COVID rules or it's now serving a completely uh, different purpose. They, we have organizations who do a fantastic job. And in this regard, I'd like to mention the Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights. They don't often get the credit they deserve, but they are the champions of public interest litigation. They do a lot of work, thankless work, across the country. A lot of it does not get the media coverage that we see in a few of the cases, maybe when a public figure has been arrested, uh, when a prominent human rights person or an opposition politician, but otherwise they do lots more work across the country because it's a, an organization uh, of, of lawyers who are you know, all over the country and whenever people are arrested, on pretty flimsy charges, you know, intimidating them, Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights is almost always there. So I don't think that it is fair to say nothing is done. I think lots of work is done. But I would also like to say that Zimbabweans should also fund their own causes. We don't do this often enough. We rely a lot on support that we get from donors. We rely a lot on support that we get from foreigners. If you ask uh, uh, 10 Zimbabweans whether they've made any single donation to the Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights, you will probably find that none of them has ever done that. But they expect the Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights to be standing up for them, those lawyers to be standing up for them whenever they get arrested, whenever they are situated. We should never do that. I think that it's important for Zimbabweans to take responsibility seriously on issues that concern them. I know that we will find excuses. We will say that we do not have money. We will say that we are poor. We will say that uh, we don't have the resources. But I think that we must also get out of that uh, mode of excuses, of finding reasons for not doing things when it's possible to find reason for doing things. Okay. So I, I, I could go on with all these other issues, Violet, but I, I thought that I would conclude, or at least I should conclude, with my uh, view on the, what I expect to see. I started with a presentation of the traditional conception of the traditional state. And I say that actually, I don't think that exists in Zimbabwe. I think what we have now is an adulterated form of that state 
and that the military is not just an arm of the state, but probably the most powerful arm of the state. In fact, it is the most powerful arm of the state, which is calling the shots as we speak, whether it's the executive, we saw this with the uh, order to ban mobile money payment systems and the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. Uh, this emanated from the security structure. There is no question people know this and they are calling the shots. So I think that we are at a critical juncture. We should be honest about our situation. Zimbabwe is a military state which has a political facade. The civilian structure is a facade. Okay. Uh, but otherwise, those who call the shots are the men in uniform and, and holding guns. Thank we you. have to, we have to. Uh, I, I, I will conclude, Violet. The problem is that uh, my expectation was that I would explain how constitutionalism should be, should be restored. And I want a minute to do, to do that because otherwise it would be a waste. We don't want to talk problems. We want to talk, how do we fix things? For me, we must begin to understand constitutionalism the same way that we understand religions, the same way that we understand belief systems. We have to hold constitutionalism as something that is sacred. I mentioned that the constitution should be the sacred text. If you go to other countries, they refer to their constitution as a sacred text and they hold it as such. We must have preachers, defenders, bishops who are able to say the word of the constitution, to preach the word of the constitution. These are the human rights defenders. We don't have Sunday service for constitutionalism, but all religions have their services for their belief systems because they must be defended. We are not going to go anywhere in Zimbabwe unless we are able to strengthen the belief system in the idea of constitutionalism. Okay. The piece is that, to, um, unfortunately, we're we, running out of time. We'll have to, we'll have to come back again. Uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully and, another time. Yes, hopefully we, another time. But you raise very good points <laughs> there. Uh, final words, um, Professor Moyo, very briefly, just at least if you can give us some practical solutions in your final words, because we're running out of time. Is Professor Moyo still there? With uh, your indulgence, I would like to defer to my uh, younger brother who just spoke well and represented all of us and uh, you will uh, hopefully invite us to some other encounters so that we can. I think he, we should not spoil what uh, Dr. Magaisa has presented by coming up with other things. I would have been happier had I been asked to speak before him. But on this occasion, I, with your indulgence, would like to defer to him. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, we're actually running out of time. So I have to bring in uh, Dr. Ibo Mandaza to give us his uh, final remarks so that uh, at least we can close on, on time. Dr. Mandaza, can you kind of point the way to the future? What do we do now in your final remarks? Well, I think first, can you hear me? Yes, we can. First, I think, uh, in the way of conclusion that the, we have a very sad situation in Zimbabwe. There is no constitutionalism. There's a, a clear breach of the constitution. The 2013 uh, constitution has not been fully implemented. Uh, secondly, the military has moved from being, being a deployee. I think the point was made by Gop, Gop Hooper very strongly that uh, in the early days, up to 2000 at least, the army was being deployed by the politicians, by ZANU-PF. Um, and that has led to a situation where the army is virtually in control. Uh, I think that point must be made very clearly. It was ZANU-PF, it was the, the politicians who were deploying an army, which in the early days was really largely adhering to the, to the constitution. Now it has become very central. As Jonathan Moyer said in, uh, in his book on, uh, on Excel Gate, Jock is the power in Zimbabwe. Um, secondly, that Zimbabwe is the odd man in the region. There is no situation in the region where the military is so dominant as it is in Zimbabwe. 
it is completely unacceptable. And that it is an issue that, that, that the region itself should be engaged with. It is an issue that must be, and, and there are very anomalous situations where Zimbabwe, notwithstanding what we just said about the role of the military, is now the head, the chair of the organ on politics, defense, and security. Very unacceptable. Thirdly, that the position that the military holds in Zimbabwe is unsustainable, particularly given the economic and political crisis in the country, and that this should prompt the military itself as citizens, the military high command as citizens, to realize, to acknowledge that there is certainly something wrong in the situation that prevails in the country at the moment. Uh, and that a way, one way forward is really one, not to negotiate with the army, but to find ways in which they can be helped out of the dilemma. Jonathan Moyer spoke of the need for a truth and reconciliation commission, which can look at the atrocities perpetrated by the army since the independence, Gugurawundi, right down into the uh, Muramba China. Uh, the 2008 uh, elections, the runoff violence, the killings on August the 1st in 20, 20, 2017, 2018, uh, the, the atrocities that uh, Justina has spoken about, the, the reports by the NGO forum, the human rights abuses, all these need to be accounted for, but also to offer opportunity for the military to make amends and to make peace with the population. Um, 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 I don't think there is much we can say beyond that. One hopes that the current discussion about the way forward, the transition authority is one forum through which or organ, organ through which these issues can be dealt with and we can have a reintroduction of the constitution, 2013 constitution, in the context of political reforms in the country, restoration of the national institutions, including the military in rightful role uh, in the barracks, and indeed to have a period during which Zimbabwe can engage in political and economic reform before the next elections. I'll stop there, and maybe Violet wants to make announcements about or should I do that? No, it's okay. I can do. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mandaza. And uh, thank you all speakers for an informative session and uh, interesting inputs from the audience. Uh, especially thank you for giving up your Thursday evening to be part of this discussion, which was supposed to be just two minutes, two hours, but it became almost uh, three hours long. So we thank you all for this. Um, don't forget uh, the next two programs will be on the 23rd of July. And uh, that topic will be South Africa's policy towards Zimbabwe, a case of the tail wagging the dog, indifference, incapacity, or harvesting a neighbor's economic woes. And then the next one after that will be on the 31st July uh, protest call, and we'll be looking at what has happened and what's next for Zimbabwe. So we hope to see you all again in the next uh, couple of weeks. Keep safe, everyone.